Texas, of course, has lots and lots of really small counties, including, including mine. We have a, a total population of 28,000. 8,000 or so of those vote, and two thirds to three fourths of those vote Republican at this point. So we have a fairly small target target group that we're going to So we mentioned that uh, Gilbert, Gilberto was talking about earlier of grouping counties together. Do you have experience in, in setting up good phone banks between multiple counties or say for an entire congressional district maybe instead of instead of county by county maybe looking at how do I how do I target all of the counties that are in a congressional district? Could you address that? Okay. Let me think about that for a minute. It, two different ways occur to me. First to go with the way you presented the question. Um, is that given the, the geography, as you kind of define the problem in a way that requires you to have some sort of online uh, plan uh, where people could log on from remote places and make the calls, because multiple counties are not going to say, oh, y'all drive here to this one place. So you kind of put your budget into a certain category if you want to do it that way. And that is, and by the way, everything I said here about management, you can do remotely because, hell, if they've met call centers in India, we could certainly have five different Texas counties having, you know, people calling at home. And in fact, a little bit of a tangent here, but in one of my call center magazines here recently, I read there's a little bit of a backlash to that. Is there's some companies that are moving their customer service back to the U.S and they're finding the way they get the savings to compare with why they had moved to India before was by having people work at home. So they're saving on the cost of the facilities and so on. So, so one way for you to go would be to have a plan of all these counties that are working together and then do everybody do your training through a webinar and same thing, all the stuff, and teaching on the script and everything, and then they can do it from home on their computers. The other thing I would say is I would sort of challenge the premise of the question and say, well, you know, why not do small local grassroots things? Even if it is a small amount, you know, get a group together to make those calls, you know, low tech, old school, but uh, bring them into some lawyer that will let them use their office at night and, um, you know, do those few thousand phone calls. Yeah, so far as going at home with Skype. Yeah, yeah. So, again, bring the social part into it because the other part I didn't get into, which I would say, is that there's side benefits of this. Part of what I kind of didn't cover, I meant to, but was from some of the slides. Uh, what you're getting from the volunteers being engaged. The same way that, uh, that was said earlier today, that if you get somebody to donate five bucks, then they're kind of invested in the campaign. They're going to be more motivated. Same way the people are making their phone calls, they're buying in. And so there's some kind of energy that radiates out of that of having other people do it. Would you describe the qualifications? for a person to work at home that you would you consider engaging? What kind of minimum qualification? Describe the qualifications for someone that you would trust to work at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a common question. Let me answer it because I run my paid business with people that work at home. Yeah. And we had 73 people working at home in the peak of the 2010 season. And here's what I do, is that uh, I'll advertise on Craigslist to start with, and I have an online application that they fill out, and uh, have certain questions. So the first thing, this isn't, I'll just to be complete, I'll list this, I know it wasn't really in your question, but it's part of the answer, is the first screening is just 
do they have the right equipment? And so we have a checklist of what's your internet speed, you know, go to speedtest.net and let's see what your speed is and you have good enough speed. Because everybody will want to tell you, but you know, is, what kind of computer do you have? You know, do you have Windows 7 or XP or whatever? So there's kind of, there's a checklist there that there's people that have older computers that couldn't do it. So they need a new computer, they need a good internet connection. You gotta have a USB headset, any other kind of headset, and that's only 20 bucks, but any other kind of headset sounds crappy. And since a lot of the voters are like me that don't have the greatest hearing, you gotta pay attention to the quality of the sound. So the USB headset, a good internet connection, a good computer, before you even start talking about the person. And then the person, pretty much by interviewing them on the phone, you can, you can tell their personality, your intuition is, is going to be correct on that. And that's what we do is just do a telephone interview with them. How do they sound on the phone? And that's actually better because you're removing some of the prejudices you might have if you saw them in person, right? Because the phone is the work they're doing. So they sound on the phone, period. And yeah. And uh, and then um, the other part, uh, I just find out by trial and error about reliability. I mean, if somebody's not consistent or reliable, we. Uh, we don't hesitate to make changes and just kind of like stuff, but there's no way to kind of predict that, really. Um, I don't know if I left anything out. Was there something else you were wanting to get at from that? No, I guess you said some, what, some minimum number of, of hours? Yeah, how, yeah, what hours are they available? Time, time yeah. uh, right, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, so we'll, for any certain project, when we put the word out, we'll have a, uh, a schedule. So it might be that this um, candidate has us calling in the afternoons to the senior citizens and in the evenings, and we're calling on Saturdays. And so I'll also have them check, you know, which hours are you available of these six days and these two time blocks. Um, the other thing I would say that might have been um, uh, kind of anticipated in that is just to assure you that you are able to supervise people very effectively, even better than you can in a call center. You can listen to everybody's calls, whereas in a call center, they know if you're standing over their shoulder. Um, you can measure everything they do, how many seconds a call is, you know, some of these percentages over the shift are behind the rest of them. So you, you can supervise them easily. What do you think is the reliability or the effectiveness now of robocalls versus uh, live calls? You put me on the spot, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for the right purpose, um, they should be used. And um, so, there's a couple different things that go into why I think what I do about robocalls, and some of them are, have to do with dispelling myths, and that is about the migration from landlines to cell phones. It, that is happening, however, when you look at the demographics of likely voters, it's not so much of a problem. So that's kind of a myth for us today. It's something to keep watching, but out of the likely voters, most of them do still have landlines. So for that purpose, that's still good. Um, it's not going to be enough on its own to stimulate somebody to vote. So the kind of things that we do, and this is going to sound a little bit like a sales pitch territory here, because we do kind of little special things where um, we'll tell them where their polling location is. So like Texas Democratic Women in Collin County was, you know, um, you know, hi, this is Barbara Walters, and um, at the end of this call, we're going to have uh, important inf voting information about your times and locations. And then you got them hooked, and then it's like, well, here's who we endorse. And then uh, a very high quality recorded voice says, your voting location is um, Robinson Middle School on Preston Meadows is open from 7 to 7. Thank you. So 
is kind of like a combination. You don't have enough people to make all the calls live, but you got that. And then the other thing you can do is press one to connect. And so we've had good success with those. And um, I think I said this when I opened up, but with Joe Jaworski here in Galveston was one of the recent ones we did. And we did one in Fort Worth too, that's right, a city council thing. But uh, where you have your basic robocall message, and then you say, if you need a ride or have any questions at all, press one to talk to us. And that's usually a small percentage that pass through, but then you answer them. So they're like, wow, I'm talking to Joe right now. Or here's the campaign office, and um, you know, oh, I have a question, where am I supposed to vote? You know, and we got one hour to go. And plus, that projects to the 99.5% of people who didn't press one. There's a different energy that you're projecting out to them. Because if this isn't just, hi, I'm Bill Clinton, and I want you to go out and vote, it's, you know, if we're calling to help you and press one and we will. Okay, Ron, we have time for one more question. Yeah, okay. It's really not a question, but this is for all the county chairs. If you don't have a list of your precincts, get it, because they have only uh, Democratic voters, and then have the precinct chairman call them. And uh, it works, because after one election, I asked the uh, election judge, which precinct has the most voters up? And he said 453, and that's my precinct, and I have been calling all my precinct members. So it really helps. So get that list, call them, and uh, let them call their precinct members. They'll get up there and vote. <laughs> I, I can stage that as the closing of my presentation. That proves how effective making phone calls is. So y'all do everything I said right here. Okay? Thank you. Appreciate it.